Today I'm going to be discussing the structure of a Cray 3 supercompute module. Before I continue, I'm going to give you a brief background on the Cray 3 supercomputer. Seymour Cray began the design of the Cray 3 in 1985, as soon as the Cray 2 reached production. Cray generally set himself the goal of producing new machines with 10 times the performance of previous models. Although the machines did not always meet this goal, it was a useful technique in defining the project and clarifying what sort of process improvements would be needed to meet it. For the Cray 3, he decided to set even a higher performance improvement goal, an increase of 12 times over the Cray 2. Cray had always attacked the problem of increased speed with three simultaneous advances, more execution units to give the system higher parallelism, tighter packaging to decrease signal delays, and faster components to allow for a higher clock speed. Of the three, Cray was normally least aggressive on the last. His designs tended to use components that were already in widespread use, as opposed to leading-edge designs. For the Cray 2, he introduced a novel 3D packaging system for its integrated circuits to allow higher densities, and it appeared that there was some room for improvement in this process. For the new design, he stated that all wires would be limited to a maximum of one foot in length. This would demand the processor to be able to fit into a cubic foot block, about one-third that of a Cray 2 CPU. This would not only increase performance, but make the system 27 times smaller. For a 12 times performance increase, the packaging alone would not be enough. The circuits on the chips themselves would have to speed up. The Cray 2 appeared to be pushing the limits of the speed of silicon-based transistors at 4.1 nanoseconds, or 244 MHz and it did not appear that anything more than another two times the performance would be possible. If the goal of 12 times the performance was to be met, more radical changes would be needed, and a high-tech approach would have to be used. Cray had intended to use gallium arsenide circuitry in the Cray 2, which would not only offer higher switching speeds, but also use less energy and thus run cooler as well. At the time the Cray 2 was being designed, the state of gallium arsenide manufacturing simply was not up to the task of supplying a supercomputer. By the mid-80s, things had changed, and Cray decided that it was the only way forward. Given the lack of investment on the part of large chip manufacturers, Cray decided to invest in a gallium arsenide chip-making startup, Gigabit Logic, and use them as an internal supplier. Describing the system in November 1988, Cray stated that a 12 times performance increase would be made up of a 3 times increase due to the gallium arsenide circuits and a 4 times increase due to the use of more processors. One of the problems with the Cray 2 had been poor multiprocessing performance due to limited bandwidth between the processors, and to address this, the Cray 3 would adopt a much faster architecture used in the Cray YMP. This would provide a design performance of 16 gigaflops. I'm now going to go through a brief overview of the Cray 3 system architecture. The Cray 3 system architecture comprised a foreground processing system and up to 16 background processors and up to 2 gigawords or 16 gigabytes of common memory. The foreground system was dedicated to input and output and system management and it included a 32-bit processor, 4 synchronous data channels for mass storage and network devices, primarily via HIPAA channels. Each background processor consisted of a computation section, a control section, and local memory. The computation section performed 64-bit scalar, floating point, and vector arithmetic. The control section provided instruction buffers, memory management functions, and real-time clock, 16 kilowords or 128 kilobytes of high-speed local memory was incorporated into each background processor, for use as temporary scratch memory. Common memory consisted of silicon CMOS SRAM organized into octants of 64 banks each and up to 8 octants possible. The word size was 64 bits plus 8 error correction bits and a total memory bandwidth was rated at 128 gigabytes per second. As with previous designs, the core of the Cray 3 consisted of a number of modules each containing several circuit boards packed with parts. In order to increase the density, the individual gallium arsenic chips were not packaged and instead several were mounted directly with ultrasonic gold bonding to a board approximately one inch squared. 
The boards were then turned over and mated to a second board carrying the electrical wiring, with wires on this card running through holes to the bottom side of the chip carrier, where they were bonded, hence sandwiching the chip between two layers of board. These submodules were stacked four deep and, as in the Cray 2, wired to each other to make a 3D circuit. Unlike the Cray 2, the Cray 3 modules also included edge connectors. 16 such submodules were connected together in a 4x4 array to make a single module measuring 121 by 107 by 7 mm. Even with this advanced packaging, the circuit density was low even by 1990s standards at about 96,000 gates per cubic inch. Modern CPUs offer gate counts of millions per square inch, and the move to 3D circuits was still just being considered as of 2017. 32 such modules were then stacked and wired together with a mass of twisted pair wires into a single processor. The basic time cycle was 2.11 nanoseconds or 474 MHz, allowing each processor to reach about 0.948 gigaflops and a 16 processor machine a theoretical 15.17 gigaflops. Key to the high performance was the high speed access to main memory, which allowed each process to burst up to 8 gigabytes per second. The modules were held together in an aluminium chassis known as a brick. The bricks were immersed in liquid fluorinate for cooling, as in the Cray 2. A four processor system with 64 memory modules dissipated about 88 kilowatts of power. The entire four processor system was about 20 inches, 510 millimeters tall, and front to back a little over 2 feet, 0.61 meters wide. For systems with up to four processors, the processor assembly sat under a translucent bronzed acrylic cover at the top of the cabinet, 42 inches, 1.1 meters wide, 28 inches, 0.71 meters deep, and 50 inches, 1.3 meters high, with the memory below it and the power supplies and cooling systems on the bottom. Eight and 16 processor systems would have been housed in a larger octagonal cabinet. All in all, the Cray 3 was considerably smaller than a Cray 2, itself relatively small compared to other supercomputers. In addition to the Cray cabinet, a Cray 3 also needed two, depending on the number of processors, system control pods or C pods, 52.5 inches or 1.33 meters square and 55.3 inches or 1.4 meters high, containing power and cooling control equipment. This brings me to the point where I'm going to discuss the structure of my Cray 3 supercompute module in detail. I've placed the module next to a standard CD to give you an idea of its dimensions. Taking a close look at my particular Cray 3 module, you can see that it's labeled as a D module with the number 43. This allows me to place it in the machine as being part of one of the background processes. As you can see from the diagram shown that each background processor consists of four modules labeled A, B, C and D. I'm now going to discuss the module's structure. The left edge of the module consists of four power blades. These machined metal blades are both the mechanical connection to the octant frame and the electrical connection to the power supply buses. The center of a module assembly is made up of three plates of full module size. The center of the module assembly and the center of plates of the three plates contains the terminating resistors or Amiga layer. Either side of the terminating resistor plates are two power plates. These plates deliver electrical current from the power blades to the circuit board stack. These three plates extend slightly beyond the outer circuit boards of the module assembly on just the left hand side of the module to give a surface area for the attachment of the power blades. Above and below the power plates are two logic plates. These plates provide logic signal communication between the board stacks. Above and below the logic plates are the two layers of 16 circuit boards which form the stacks. These boards contain integrated circuit packages and interconnections between the packages. Electrical communication between the individual boards and board stacks is by the logic plates. The outer surface of the module assembly is covered by a protective overlay. The overlay is arranged as part of each board stack on the top and bottom. This entire sandwich of components is illustrated in the figure shown. It should be noted that the sandwich of layers shown in the figure shows only the basic layer groupings. 
Each of the layers shown also has more layers of their own. For example, the logic plates themselves contain 15 layers of material each. Logic communication and power distribution in the XY dimension is within the circuit boards and within the plates. Communication through the stacks in the Z axis is via twist pin jumpers, which provide the connection between the logic boards, logic plates, and terminating resistor plates. Z axis connection for power is provided by a larger twist pin for power purposes, which provide connection between the logic boards and the two power plates. Both the logic and power pin jumpers make connections by means of spring forces. The assembly pins have a countersunk head on one end to make an interface to fit to the other end in the protective overlays. This image shows what the twist pin connectors actually look like. The small squares in the module assembly represent the integrated circuit packages. There are 16 gallium arsenic integrated circuit packages on each circuit board. With 64 boards in a module assembly, this means that there are 1024 positions in a module assembly for gallium arsenic integrated circuit packages. Here's an example of a logic circuit board showing all the wires and the positions where the gallium arsenide chips are mounted. Here are the trace lines on a logic circuit board. This is the logic plate and this image shows the trace lines on the logic plate. This is an example of the resistor plate and here's a close-up of the resistors. This image depicts the process by which the gallium arsenide chips are mounted to the logic circuit boards. And as you can see, the legs of the chips are actually stamped into the wires by a stamper. Here's a nice depiction of the cross-sectional arrangement of a Cray 3 module. This image depicts how power is distributed within the module within the X, Y and Z axes. I just want to end this video off by stating that the Cray 3 was an absolute marvel of engineering for its time. And you can see from the construct of these modules that Seymour Cray was way ahead of his time when it came to engineering.